Welcome to what is this week three technically of the Inklings? It is. Okay. Yeah. So cool stuff. Um, obviously, we're down a couple people, but that is okay. I don't know if you guys can also see this on my copy, but it says an epic motion picture trilogy coming soon from New Line Cinema. <laughs> Nice. Ooh. I assure you there are much older copies out there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just thought it was funny that they took the time to put that on there. So. Yeah. Well, well, that was probably yeah. also, this is the first copy I've ever owned. So that's kind yeah. of indicative of the first time that I read it is just about 20 years ago. You know, interestingly enough, I... For as much as I was kind of dreading going through this part of the book, because it's typically one of my least favorite parts, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I thought it was really good, actually. I thought it was good. Yeah. Why, it, why do you consider it, or why did you think it was your least favorite? Well, I'm always, like, really hyped for or the Council of Elrond and all of that stuff. And so yeah. this stuff that kind of like takes place in the meantime to me yeah. is not typically as interesting. So I, I got excited about meetings like that, Brett. Like <laughs> oh, all this adventure stuff. Let's just go to the meeting. Yeah. Well, there's so much good lore that happens in in the meeting so oh um, yeah no i'm sure i'm just thinking of um, how much i hate meetings <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um, scheduled another meeting yeah. yeah well i mean it's kind of like as i was reading through it i was like i can understand why they were able to pick up a lot of territory in the films through this part because really yeah. there's you know, I missed, I, I'd i forgotten uh, Butterbur because I thought he was kind of a cool character. Yeah. Um, and I think the funniest thing to me, I don't, I don't I might be jumping the structure that you had for this, so I apologize. But okay. I thought it was kind of funny that in the films, you know, Aragorn is so dark and brooding. And in the book, yeah, he's kind of off to the side, but the minute he's in the room, he's just like, hey, I'm Strider, and <laughs> I'm going to take you someplace if you like me. You know, it's just like, he's yeah. kind of a, he's joking around a lot, which is kind of funny. Yeah, he's definitely, uh, one of the notes that I made about Aragorn in general in the books is he, he doesn't lack the self-confidence like he does in the films like he he is very well aware of who he is and what his place is in middle earth and in the books he's really not ashamed of that right. um in the films they try to like give him this whole like guilt thing yeah lucked in the yeah. yeah and you really don't get that vibe from him in the books he 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 is pretty well embraced what his journey is going to be and right. i think he's okay with um, you, you'll see like little hints of him being hesitant at times in the books, but nowhere near like he is in the films. Right. That, that, that's definitely a key difference in that character for sure. Yeah. Well, just going down through some of my notes, uh, a couple things that I noticed right off the bat. Um, I always forget about Nob, uh, the little hobbit servant. I always liked him in the books and he's not really, you know, involved in the films at all. So, but I always thought he was kind of a cool character and he has some decent dialogue. But he only appears in, in this part of the book, right? It's not like he shows yeah. up anywhere else. Okay. No, this is his only spot, but he's still okay. cool. I, okay. I like him, you know, his literary life is short, but you know that if I could say one thing about Tolkien's writing, is he makes these little, quote, you know, like NPC characters that aren't very important to the story. He gives them a lot of life and juice, like when you're reading about reading through the book. And I feel like it's easy to make like small connections with the with these characters that you otherwise just like probably wouldn't care about a whole lot. So right, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> Nob's got juice. 
Penobscot Chief's <laughs> Law. <laughs> um, chapter nine, just a few notes that I had. I uh, thought it was interesting, like, because um, this was mentioned earlier as well. There's like this migration of the dwarves happening um that's kind of like an undertone but like it's not really ever talked about in in the films but it's mentioned i think this is like the third or fourth time it's been mentioned in the books how like the the dwarves are migrating like northwest right now to get away from mordor and yeah. that, that's that's well, interesting I pick up on that i mean you know they well because whenever they're whenever they first got into the prancing pony you know i know that uh, Butterbird mentions like, oh, we're like packed out, you know, we've got dwarves and, you know, like, the, I don't know, we have these different types of people and it's just like, if you weren't hobbits, you know, then we probably wouldn't have room for you. Yeah. But, yeah, it's just, yeah, there there definitely is a sense where it's in the movie, like, Gimli is the, pretty much the only dwarf that you really see. He's the, in the token movie. dwarf, but yeah. It's like, even though the dwarves aren't like super involved in the main story. It's, I don't know, it's just like it, I don't know, I guess the, the towns and stuff, at least the vibe I'm getting, it just, it feels more lively and diverse than what is, um, yeah, than, I don't know, just kind of what you got from the movies. And, and again, specifically with Brie, you know, they, they were specifically talking about, uh, I don't know, just like the heritage of the like people there and just how they like, you know, I, I think it, it was said that they like, I don't know, maybe predate like some of the like, I don't know, like most of the other like people like in Middle Earth, it, you know, because they're, they're just said to be like hardy, you know, folk. Yeah. And so there's like a certain pride associated with that. But it's also diverse because you've got the hobbits there, you know, you've dwarves the humans and so it's a, it's an interesting niche and then you got the rangers yeah you know, they're just kind of around that people don't trust real and i think it's interesting that like you have this these groups of people who are basically trying to like move there to like seek refuge and there's a little bit of disdain for all these people trying to move in you know to their their area it almost kind of just feels like the dwarves don't care, <laughs> you know, they're, they're going to move in anyway, you know. Uh, I, I thought that was interesting. Um, Matt, you know, what were some other things that you noticed that kind of differed from, um, you know, the, uh, the film as far as mainly like that, that section in the Prancing Pony. I'd like to kind of key in on that because that's kind of like its own little subsection there. Right. Well, I mean, obviously in the movie, Frodo's, I think you've mentioned before how Frodo, for the most part of the movies, if it wasn't for the single-minded purpose, he doesn't really have a character necessarily because he's always so focused and stressed on the ring in the movies and reactive to what's going on to him that he doesn't really have a chance to show what he's actually about. And in that one, he actually gets up on a table and recites his little poem and things like that. And so the, the way that he accidentally puts on the ring is much different than from how it happens in the book. And he's a bit more oblivious to it. Yeah. So I guess in the, he hasn't, in the, at this point in the book, maybe he, hasn't exactly accepted the gravity of his situation, which is something that Strider kind of tries to reinforce when he talks to them later on in the room. He's just kind of like, I don't think you guys really understand what's going on here. And he's like, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't have gone into the common room and talked to everybody. I was like, yeah, <laughs> my, that might have <laughs> been a good idea. <laughs> in <the> room. <laughs> so he's a uh, a bit more clueless and happy-go-lucky, but you get more of an impression of who he is as a person in the book than in yeah, the They really absolutely. drew it down to yeah. the real stereotypical parts in the film. Yeah, and Bill Fernie, man, like I'm, yeah, that he, he, I forgot like how much of a douche he is like in the books, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that was, I don't remember exactly what your exact question was. Just anything that you noticed was different oh. in the films and, and the Brie 
yeah segment uh, before we move on to the wilds you know right and uh, i was going to kind of go into this a little bit later but, but also how the ring rates i guess in a way are acting a lot more mortal in the books than they are in the films because they're so single-minded of purpose and they're such a driving force in the films, probably very deliberately, but in the books, they seem to be underestimating the hobbits and they're really not driving that hard. And you've still got some of them back and, you know, going after uh, what's his name and the brandy wine, <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's like, it's like real late in the chapters and you still have people poking around in the Shire when they've been gone for like ever at that point. Yeah. And then even they're riding up and down roads. Hey, have you heard anything about any hobbits? You know, because we really like to hear something about it. And instead, in the books, they're just like, we're going to like suck your soul out through your ass and kill you. <laughs> you know, it's just like, so they seem a lot less, you know, crazy in the books than they are in the movies. So, yeah. Yeah. No, it... The other thing that I thought was interesting, they keep, they they mention like when Mary has the run in um, with them, um, whenever he was spying on Bill. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, he said he was like this, like black breath that knocked him out. Yeah. But when Aragorn starts talking about them, and again, this, this kind of goes back to that, like, you know, home field advantage matters sort of thing in Lord of the Rings. Aragorn like talks about how like they wouldn't break into a house that was well lit and full of people because they don't have, that would weaken their power. Like they, they're strengthened by your loneliness, by the darkness, by your fear. Yeah. You know, those things give them power. Um, and so it's, you know, I thought it was interesting. I don't want to dive too, but even like later in the chapter, um, you know, we, we hear about, you know, how they, you know, attacked Gandalf and you'll learn more about that attack later on in the book, but you know, they intentionally attacked him at night, you know, they, they, they wouldn't dare try to assault him in the daylight, Yeah, you know? And so there's, there's definitely that that theme of them being very tied to the darkness and being fed by that. Right. Um, which is why I think in certain battles, you know, like Sauron will like try to blot out the sun, you know, before the orcs march, before, you know, they go to fight because they want to fight under cover of night. They don't want to fight in broad daylight. Right. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. One thing that I thought was really funny was that Gandalf had, had given Butterbur that letter. Yeah. And I totally spaced that. And that was hilarious. Um, because Gandalf basically already knew, one, that the dude was going to be a total jackass and forget, forget, you know, two, that Frodo had already used the ring to tell him not to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> and then three, you know, to follow Aragorn. Um and I liked when he said, you know, I'm going to burn, you know, I'm going to roast, you know, Butterbur after Butterbur literally just finished saying, like, man, I hope he didn't, like, turn me into a frog or something, you know. <laughs> yeah. So. MVP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now, this was interesting. I looked this up. When they talked about this Southerner, like, this agent, um, yeah. They describe him as like being like half orc. And so like I was looking that up and a lot of people think that was like one of the early bred Urukai from Saruman, who was there as a spy. Didn't um uh, I thought in the book, didn't they refer to him as your handsome friend? Didn't Butterbur when he was chastising them because they're they were trying to get their money's worth out of their horses. And he was like, well, you brought your handsome friend into my inn, so maybe you should be. I think he was being sarcastic. Oh, that would make much more sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Um, and then like another shining moment for Sam. I love whenever he nails Bill in the face with the apple. Yeah. 
which, you know, the way that they talk about hobbits being able to fling rocks and stuff like that, he probably did some damage. To yeah. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Like, ping. <laughs> um, another thing that's really important, because in the films, it's not until Return of the King that Elrond brings in Duril the sword to Aragorn. And, and then in Fellowship, it's like sitting in shards in Rivendell. That's yeah. not, like, that's not at all how it goes. Like, Aragorn already has the sword with him, and he's always carried it with him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's still broken, but he does have it with him. I kind of wondered about that. I didn't, because uh, when I read it, I was just like, does he just have the hilt and the scabbard? Because, I mean, somebody taking the pieces and just putting like, the point yeah. in it seemed like a bad idea so it made me wonder if it was i i would think that it would look somewhat similar to how it did um well in in the films because it, it was the shattered blade that cut the ring off right it just only had like that much of the blade and it was just that sharp edge that cut off the ring i think right. that's what he has with him okay and the other shards are probably still in rivendell Okay, because that's kind of what I was assuming when I read it like that. And Aragorn well, was raised carry around that he wouldn't have another sword on him, though. That yeah, I'm sure he does. Yeah, but um, now and he was raised in Rivendell, so I imagine he was given that as a gift at some point. You know, yeah. by Elrond. Here, carry around this busted sword. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's right. Um, but... I also I thought it was power to forge it back anytime I want to. I'm just not going to do it yet. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I think it's kind of like you know you'll earn, you you'll get your car keys when you earn it. You know that yeah. sort of situation. But you get this Yugo on your 16th birthday. <laughs> yeah, and then I also liked that uh, Gandalf included the prophecy about the return of the king in the letter. Yeah, um, so I thought that was pretty cool. He was just showing off at that point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think. Anything else that stuck out to you guys about the Prancing Pony and the inn itself? I mean, Bilbo's song about the, the spoon and the, you know, the cow and the moon and stuff. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm like... I don't, I don't know. I, 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 I take certain things for granted. Like, I just assumed that was a nursery rhyme that existed that Tolkien was just, like, Stealing. riffing on. Because yeah. um, I'm like, I'm like, that, I'm like, there's no way that that came from this, right? Yeah. I'd assume that he was just appropriating it to give more credence to that world being a long-forgotten memory of this one. That's something that somehow or another through the millennia made it through an oral history to just kind of give it credibility. Because yeah. I think there was some other poem earlier on that had a facet of that, wasn't there? Well, yeah, he's writing it from the perspective of it being a real history, you know. But, but, but is, he, is he actually like, like is Middle Earth, like is that supposed to be like some like distant future for past, like, past for, for, us. for us okay past for us yeah like what like he'll, he talks about how like they're like in modern day you know there aren't many magical creatures left and how you know he, he yeah okay so, so so it was distant past yeah yeah like basically this is like his mythology for britain that was basically what he was you know what he was writing so so like so the the continents because you've got you've got middle earth and then you hear like of like you know the kings and stuff coming from the west and stuff like is that like alluding to i don't know okay that would be a good bunny trail to go down i w i would definitely research that because yeah i i, I have no idea <laughs> you know i really don't um so moving on from Brie, um, them getting out into the Brie, yeah, um, getting out into the wild. Yeah. Um, 
that's i mean that was a way longer journey because he was saying it's like a 14 day you know kind of haul hike yeah yeah with and most of that with no horses so um i thought that was interesting but also kind of goes back to what i was saying about the ring race taking their sweet time and really not you know they've already got intelligence that they left brie that they were in brie and then they sort of lose them for a couple weeks i think some of that is due to aragorn's skill you know to i kind of took it as again they were lying in wait so i almost think that they just took the road to the ford most of them just thinking that's where they're gonna go so yeah. why should we go tromp through the woods, especially after they lose them at a uh, weather top? And it's just like, hey, it was... we'll just wait. You know, Sauron can just dip until <laughs> we get the ring back at the Ford. No big deal. I thought it was interesting that they, that they decided to try to pick a fight with Gandalf. Yeah. I, I, that, that was a very interesting move. Um, well, but 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 I mean, was it? I mean, like I, they were speculating that it was with Gandalf, but it was. The book will confirm it okay. more later. But yeah, it, it was. It was a fight with Gandalf. Like, why would they even bother? I don't know. And and, and the book doesn't ever really confirm why they did it, but they definitely did. Um, they caught him off guard at night and tried to kill him. You know. Maybe they have like a standing order from Sauron. It's like if you run into anybody except Saruman out there. Yeah. Uh, or it could be. I mean, because uh now they may have thought that he had the ring. Yeah. Yeah. Except yeah. wouldn't they know? Pretty I mean, they've got that innate sense. Wouldn't they be able to tell that they were nowhere near the ring? Yeah, you know, I was reading something online that says, you know, they're drawn to all rings of power, and Gandalf does carry one of the elven rings. So they may have been drawn to that. Okay. You know, and wanted to kill him and take, but I don't, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I don't know, but I do think it's interesting the descriptive language that they use where, you know, they're sleepy and all of a sudden they start seeing all these flashes of light, you know, off in the distance, which is clearly Gandalf, you know, blowing some sort of magic towards these guys. Um, and then when they get there, they find scorch marks, you know, all over the ruins. So he had clearly been shooting some kind of fire at them. So, yeah. No, dude, he was just shooting off fireworks. <laughs> he does like fireworks. And I, I thought it was interesting, too, you know, when Aragorn was talking about, he's like, you know, like, listen, Gandalf, you guys just know him as, like, this, like, firework guy, but that's, like, not, you know, what he is. And he makes this comment. He says, you know, I, I'm not yeah. sure that anyone saved the enemy himself could hinder Gandalf. He made that comment earlier in, in the chapter. So, you know, yeah, he, yeah. he obviously has like a really high opinion of, you know, who Gandalf is and what he represents to Middle Earth. Which but, I know we've talked about the Harry Potter stuff a lot. But that kind of reminds me of all that too. Not only the, the Sauron and Gandalf, but also even just the race, kind of like what you were talking about, about the not wanting to attack people in groups or, or you know preying on people just dementors that was always a big jag in the harry potter books so. yeah no and you definitely like kind of get that vibe that the nazgul um you know they they're very much opportunist um for sure yeah. um I also thought it was interesting that the Nazgul can't see on their own in the daylight. Their horses have to basically be yeah. their eyes. Yeah. And they can sense blood and fear. <laughs> and they can sense the ring and that they fear fire. Yeah. With that. Well, Which made sense why Gandalf would have been shooting fire at him, you know. Yeah. Yeah, well, because I, I feel like the Hobbits bring up the fact that, like, I don't know, like in their earlier encounter, they're they're like they're, they were like sniffing for us or something, you know, yeah. something like that. Where, right. <laughs> kind of going back to the movies, I always thought it was kind of weird when they did that fight on Weathertop and Aragorn sticks one with the torch. Why it goes, ah, and I'm just like, what's the problem? 
<laughs> you know, what I mean, it's like you're this undead ring wraith. What's with the torch, buddy? Just pluck it out and go about your business. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, there's definitely some continuity issues between the Witch King on Weathertop and the Witch King as he is in the in Return of the King, but yeah, you know, it is what it is. You know, what what are you gonna do? Um. You know, and then um, did you, you know, and this is something that we can spend some like real time on, but um, Aragorn, you know, they want Aragorn to tell them some stories to help them chill out because they're scared. Yeah. You know, when they're at Weathertop. Um, so he told them the story of Baron and Luthien. Um, did any of either of you guys have any chance at all to like look into them at all? Like, or do you, do you guys have like any kind of like idea of Baron and Luthien in that story? So, I mean, I wrote down some notes, just like some like basic cliff notes, because it's a whole book. I yeah. mean, in and of itself, it's a very short book. It's only like three hundred pages, and like most of that is like not the story itself. It's like a bunch of appendices, appendices and stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah, like, I <laughs> so I mean I, I mean the only thing I mean what I got from it was I'm like oh that kind of you know parallel I well I I don't know how much the you know the book versus the movie you know but at least in the movie like I'm like oh that like parallels the love story between yes Aaron and and Liv yeah and Arwen yeah ab absolutely so. Yeah, and, and here's the thing, like, they're both technically descendants of Baron and Luthien, although not in, like, an incesty sort of way. <laughs> no, and it was cool because we had so much extra time, you know, to, like, get through the reading. I was able to, like, dive more into the first age this, this past week, and, like, for some reason, out of all the times I've tried to study it, like, this time it actually stuck. <laughs> for me which was nice yeah. um and you know like here yeah, I, I just took some notes i'll just like roll through them real quick but like okay so um baron and luthien so kind of going back to the first age you have creation with the iluvatar he creates the valor and then the lesser valor called the Meyer, which is like what Gandalf and the Balrogs and Sauron and all on that kind of tier level. Right. Um, and then after they were created, um, Melkor, who's the most powerful of all of the, um, and, and uh, Aragorn mentions him specifically, he says, you know, um, to whom Sa Sauron was only like, a commander, he was only like a lieutenant to him, you know, because uh, Melkor is much more powerful. But the other thing that's really interesting is like they have very different personalities too, though. I would say that Sauron is much more cunning than Morgoth. Morgoth was so powerful that like he was very arrogant and like really susceptible to flattery. Um, so like he made a lot, a lot more strategic mistakes in my opinion, than what Sauron did. So, yeah, I, I did have a question about that. I mean, again, I think we, we talked about this a little before, but just like how, like, in e as each age, um, how it progresses from one age to the next, how things kind of deteriorate, like, in some way. Yeah. Um, and it's like, okay, you know, if Sauron was, I don't know, just, I don't know, like, a, a much lesser person to this, like, other guy, did, did um, by Sauron using the rings and stuff, like, was he able to elevate himself or is just like, or is, or, or are every, or, or is like all of the major powers that were like in previous ages, are they just gone? And so it's- like, I think it's both. I think it's both. I think you you have both the de deterioration of magic in Middle Earth in general um and just less mystical power in in the land as it were and then you know but also the binding of the rings essentially was him 
you know, he went, uh, this was in the second age, you know, he went as this, uh, he looked like an elf. He called himself Anatar. And he just went and he was like a gift giver. They call him Anatar the gift giver. And he went around basically trying to offer the rings that Celebrimbor was helping to build to make as, you know, rings that would help these different races govern with strength. And basically, without any of their knowledge, the One Ring bound all the power of all those races to him. Except for the three Elven Rings, they found out before he did that, and they were able to, they were never touched by Sauron. And so they're able to operate outside of that. So the three Elven Rings aren't controlled by the One Ring. Um, So that's an important distinction. But the nine... Um, the nine with men, and then I think it's the five or seven of the dwarf rings, um, you know, those are all basically bound under his power, and he's drawing all that energy from all of them. But the downside to it was, you know, by, by putting so much of himself in the ring was that whenever it was removed from him, it's like he lost half of himself, you know, when he did that. So, um, I would say both. I think Middle Earth has gotten weaker and Sauron did become much stronger, although still not nearly as powerful as Morgoth. Uh, Morgoth would have wiped the floor with anybody that we're talking about um, in in this. Uh, Although there was an elf that did a 1v1 with Morgoth and actually held his own with him for a while. So, (laughs) came really close and then finally got killed. But... Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, so going back, first age, you have basically three important families of elves, um, that were created in Middle Earth, and so you have the Sindar elves, or they're called Tellery elves in the Silmarillion. Some famous, um, Sindar elves would be like Aragorn, Thranduil, um, they're more referred to as like what's called gray elves. So they're not, they're not like super magical, but they're very tough warriors. Um, and then you have, uh, you have uh, the Vanyar, which really aren't very important and aren't really mentioned. The two like lines of elves that are pretty much like exclusively used in the stories are going to be the Sindar elves and the Noldor elves. So the Noldor is almost like all of your big, bad, powerful elves are almost all Noldor. So like Galadriel, Elrond, um, all of the first like king elves in the first age, mostly Noldor. Uh, So that family line, there was a handful of them that were born in Middle Earth. Now they were born in a section of Middle Earth that's no longer there. It's kind of like an Atlantis type story where it was like dropped off of Middle Earth into the sea. Um, and so anyway, that, that, that portion of Middle Earth was called Beleriand. Um, and uh, basically the elves woke up there and lived. <laughs> <laughs> lived there, you know, for a long time. Um, And at that point in Middle Earth, there's no sun, no moon. Um, Morgoth, as he's called now, has been banished from Valinor, or heaven, if you will, which is a landmass way off across the ocean to the west. So you have Valinor off here to the west, you have Middle Earth, the elves wake up, they're the first living things. And then the the um, Valar decide that they want to start inviting the elves to come over to see Valinor, to check out and see, you know, what that land looked like. So those who accepted the invitation, which were primarily the Noldor and the Tellery, went across and they saw what were called the two trees, which are basically like a play off of the Garden of Eden sort of thing. Uh, but those two trees were the light that lit the whole earth. Um, again, very big biblical playoff there. Um, um, but anyway, they, um, 
they come there, they check them out, they fall like crazy in love with the beauty of these trees and start writing all these songs about it. And then Morgoth comes with, um, you guys are familiar with Shelob? Yeah. Shelob's mother, Ungoliat, which was a Maiar, an evil Maiar spider, massive spider, went with Morgoth and they destroyed the two trees. Now those two trees were how they built the Cimmerals. The Cimmerals were the three jewels that were basically, they captured light from those two trees and put them in those jewels. You're gonna see a common theme throughout all the ages of Middle Earth of fighting over stupid damn jewelry all the time. Like, they, like people just get in these stupid fights and have these blood feuds over jewelry, whether it be elves or dwarves or men, people get obsessed with this stuff. Um, but the Cimmerals were important because they were the last remaining light of the two trees and thus, you know, the most beautiful thing in Middle Earth. Um, so long story short, you have your couple different, you know, families. The Noldor elves were the main ones who went across to Valinor, saw the two trees, they were enlightened and they got all this magic power from it. And then some who didn't, which would be like Legolas's or um, Legolas, Legolas's um, ancestors. They didn't go across to see the two trees. They stayed in Middle Earth, um, and that's why they were called the Grey Elves. So um, Fingal, who is Luthien's father, at that point, um, is running his Elven kingdom. Morgoth's being a dick and messing everything up in Middle Earth. This dude named Baron shows up, his, his father's kingdom, he's a, he's a um, human prince. His father's kingdom's been destroyed by Morgoth. And he falls in love with Luthien, who's like considered the most beautiful elf who ever lived. And, uh, and Arwen's uh, compared to her a lot as like being almost as beautiful as her. Huh. Um, so, and again, a direct descendant of her. So then Thingol, who's her father, the king of the, uh, the Silver, or the Sindar Elves there in Elfland, um, he marries a Maiar, which was kind of like risque, if you will. He marries like an angelic beating, like a female version of Gandalf. <laughs> and so Luthien is actually only half elf, elfish, elvish. You know, she's part Maiar, part, part elf, which okay. is why she's so beautiful and has these magical songs and yada, yada, yada. So um, Baron falls in love with her, asks for her hand in marriage. Thingol's like, there's no way, you're human. She's the most beautiful girl on earth, no way. He's like, fine, I'll tell you what, if, if you want to marry my daughter, go gather me one of the Simrols off of the crown of Morgoth and bring it back to me and you can marry my daughter. Which of course was just like a complete dick move, you know, because there's no possible way this dude is gonna have any chance of being able to go get a Simrol from Morgoth. Um, so anyway, he goes on a big long journey, pals up with some elves and uh, ends up getting captured by Sauron. Um, and Sauron, along with a bunch of his werewolves, kill a bunch of the elves and uh, bite Baron's hand off, and they end up killing him. And it's this whole big long thing. But eventually, Luthien does. Luthien goes after him, and she has this spell where she can put Morgoth to sleep. And she puts Morgoth to sleep, and they do get one of the Simrels, the Simrels, and. Um, um, it it kind of turns into a Romeo and Juliet kind of story because they both end up passing, actually. But then they're revived by the Valor and they're allowed to live together for eternity, even though she's elf, elvish and he's a man. They allow them to like have their own special place in eternity. Because in Middle Earth, they don't go to the same heaven. Men go to a different place than elves do. But they allowed them to be in the same place together because of their love. So, with the love. <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's a really good read because it, it really fleshes out Sauron a lot more. You actually get like a lot of dialogue from him, which is nice because I feel like in the books and in the films, like 
there's just not like a lot of connection with him as a villain or like understanding his motivation for doing things. And oh, yeah. when you actually I mean, what more motivation do you need? <laughs> World domination. Um, but like, you know, the reason why him and Morgoth and all the other uh, fallen Maya are upset with the Valor and upset with the Iluvatar is they think that it's unfair that they were banished simply for doing things different than the Iluvatar wanted them to. And, you know, I, I mean, there are a lot of people who actually feel like they're not wrong, you know, when they, when they read through these books because they just felt like it was wrong. Morgoth was banished just because he wouldn't sing the same songs that the other Valor would, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, there, there's a lot more motivation behind what they're doing than like I'm just an evil overlord and I'm going to make some rings and kill people you know they, it's all to get back at God the whole, the whole thing is so that's like a real big I mean I have tons more notes on it but I will not make you sit through it because there's a crap ton of it if you want to learn more about the first stage of Middle Earth I recommend it there's some really great like infighting between the elves. Like there's the kin slain where the elves actually attack within their own families and there's a big civil war and it's bloody and cool. Um, and then they get a curse put on them and told that no matter what they do, they'll never be able to beat Morgoth, which is true. They never end up being able to beat him. Um, and they die time and time and time again, trying to beat him. Um, it's, it's kind of tragic, but it's a really good story. Uh -huh. Well, and especially if you like like cool like hero tales, there's a couple times where like these really powerful characters will just like you know cast off restraint and fly into Morgoth's fortress and try to fight him, you know. And they they know they're gonna lose, but they you know it's but the battles are really cool. Yeah, you know. So. Anyway, eventually the Valor end up realizing that Middle Earth is going to be screwed if they don't do something about Morgoth, and they come across the ocean themselves and beat his ass and throw him in a cage. Nice. <laughs> a big group of them, because he was actually stronger than any of them by, by themselves. Wow. So... Uh, but yeah, if you have if you have a chance, like make sure like um, if you want to learn about the first age, try not to get spun off on all the other elven families because like it'll just like take you way off in left field, and there's just so much there's no way you'd be able to digest it. Just focus on the Neldor and the Tellery, and like everything that's important in Middle Earth is pretty much contained within those two races of elves. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it also gives some really good explanation for like why Galadriel is so powerful because she was born in Valinor. She was born in heaven. Um, her family went across um, and when the kinslaying happened, her father was one of the original sons from the original Noldor elf. So she's like third generation elf. I mean, she's, she's that old. Um, and she's also Arwen's grandmother if you didn't know that. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. So she is Arwen's grandma. <laughs> um, her daughter married Elrond, Galadriel's daughter. Okay. Um, but part of the reason why most Noldor have brown hair, but part of the reason why um, Galadriel didn't is because she spent so much time at the two trees that like her hair turned blonde. And that's why she's so much more powerful than most of the other elves. Because she, she, there's something, I don't know, like this ethereal thing where when the elves spent time with the trees, it gave them magical abilities. I don't really get that. But, um, mm. and then of course they all ended up coming back to Middle Earth. So this is a total aside kind of question, but when Gimli asks her for some of her hair, isn't that like a bit more of an ask? If, because if she was there yes. long enough to, so I'm, I'm thinking of like Spartacus, that like maybe these yeah. two hairs that Gimli has, you know, and centuries later somebody finds them, they're like, 
<laughs> no, they contain some of the light of the two trees, which is like a really big deal. I mean, yeah, yeah. for the elves especially. Yeah. You know, the, the, the whole thing with the Simrals, you know, when they built the Simrals, it was Feanor who built them. And he was the son of the very first Noldor king, of the very first one. And then he, and Feanor was the half, half uncle of Galadriel. So uh, Finn Wei, who's the king, had a son. His wife died, and then he got remarried, had four more kids. And Finn Farron was one of those kids who's Galadriel's dad. Okay. And so when, when Feanor created the Simrils, they liked, made him go psychotic. Like, he was so obsessed with them, like, he couldn't, like, not be around them. Like, he... he, he got like the dwarf gold lust type thing for them because he was so obsessed with the light of the trees. So when Morgoth destroyed the two trees, he hid them with his father in his father's kingdom, uh, Fenway's kingdom in, in Middle Earth. Um, he sent them across the sea to hide there. Well, Morgoth marched into fin Fenway's kingdom, murdered him and took the, the Simrils. So when Feanor found out about that, he like went psycho and gathered all, all the elves that were there in Valinor and then his half brothers who were from the other mom to go with him to go slay Morgoth, which was a stupid idea. There's no way they could have done it. Um, but he was just that obsessed. And then he found out that, you know, they didn't have any ships nor any knowledge of sailing. So they didn't have any way to get across. Well, the Tellery or the the Sindar elves, they had the ships, but they did they wouldn't get they wouldn't give them up. So the Noldor elves slaughtered the Tellery elves, and so Thingol, who's Luthien's dad, who's a Sindar elf, is super pissed at the Noldor elves, and that's part of the reason why he wants them to go get one of Simrils is to lord it over Feanor's head, and be like, "Fuck you! I took it, you know, like you <laughs> you, you you like slaughtered all my family, you know, because." Um, he ended up killing a bunch of Thingol's family there in Valinor. Um, so, but Finn Farron was the one son who, who him and his people would not take part in the kinslaying. They, they were the only Noldor who weren't cursed. Most of the Noldor were cursed and not allowed to come back to Middle-earth. But Galadriel's line are not cursed. They're allowed, or not Middle-earth, but back to Valinor. They're allowed to go back west, um, but most of the Noldor elves were cursed and not allowed to come back because of what they did by slaughtering the elves. Uh, hmm. it was really bad, you know, and so even whenever they took the boats and, and Feanor was sailing across the ocean, one of the god of the sea, if you will, threw this huge storm and showed up and told him, like, you know, you're going to be cursed to basically live forever and never be able to be Morgoth. It's never going to happen. You know, you're not going to be able to do it. Um, but because his half-brother Finn Farron decided not to join in in the fight, he was able to stay in Valinor, and then he became king of the Noldor there in Valinor um, and, and had a bunch of kids, including Galadriel. Galadriel was one of those kids there. Okay. So... And then if you follow the descendants down, um, at some point, Baron and Luthien's kids um, end up leading to the line of kings, um, the half-elven kids. There's basically two half-elven kids. You have Elrond, and then there was Arendil, who's his brother. Arendil decided to be human. Elrond decided to be elf. And so they get, they get to claim which one they want to do. Um, and then Erendil died in the fight against Sauron. Um, and Elrond lived. Uh, but if you trace that line down on that side of it from Thingol and, and um, his Meyer wife or Baron and Luthien, which would be the next step down, you get all the way down to Aragorn um, through the line of kings. But also you get down to Elrond who splits off and marries Galadriel's daughter, which then basically puts them in contact with the Noldor. So it's, it's kind of complicated, but if you look at the family tree, it makes sense where it all kind of connects down. 
And so it would mean that like Aragorn and um, Arwen are like very distant cousins of some sort. Um, but I, I, I would recommend diving into it, if not just to like learn a little bit more about the villains and like why they are the way they are. Also, there's just a lot more cool magic stuff in the first stage, like vampires and werewolves and dragons and more Belrogs um, and, you know, big fights with them. And I think that stuff's pretty cool. Yeah. So how, how about that part where Frodo gets stabbed? <laughs> what about that? it? <laughs> I think Kevin's trying to put us back on track a little yeah. bit in his not so subtle way. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Um, uh, I mean, yeah, Morgon, Morgon Blade, man. Although, yeah, it's it, like, I was kind of surprised how long, like, he goes, like, before it, like, gets really bad for him. Because yeah. they're just like, oh, yeah, we've got, like, a fortnight, you know, to, to get it's to... Like, ooh, ah, mm. it's kind of cool. Well, I think the King's Foil helped a lot. So, yeah, but and I think it helped a lot more than it did the films. Well, and also I think it it goes further to like to kind of show the strength of hobbits. But they also missed out on that opportunity to say, "Well, the ring race were drawn to them because they were making up some nice crispy bacon." <laughs> it was just like, nah, they just knew they were there. No yeah, big they, thing. There's not nearly as much bumbling by Mary and Pip in the books yeah. as there is in, in the films. They use them, they use them basically for beats, you know, like that in the films, but they're not, they're not really those characters. Uh, I was just going to say, I like, I really like Sam's song about the trolls. I don't know, what was it about? Uh, well, it was it was right around the time that they you know because they like kind of stumble upon the three trolls, and um, I don't know they're just kind of like chatting back and forth, and um, they have Sam uh, like do a song or something because you know Frodo is not not really feeling good, and so uh, you know he does this this song, and Mary and Pip are like, wow, you know we never heard this song. Or, you know, it's like, I, you know, I've never heard any of this before. It's like, you know, where, you know, where did you come by it? And Frodo is like, oh, well, um, you know, that kid, that came out of Sam's mind, you know, and they're like, oh, yeah, we learned, learning a lot about you, Sam, you yeah. know, and et cetera. But, uh, I don't know, pretty, pretty cool, I don't know, random yeah, I, I like when they find the trolls. I thought that was a nice little callback. Yeah, nice tie-in. I thought that was yeah. pretty cool, too. Yeah, and, you know, in general, there are quite a few little callbacks to The Hobbit throughout the, you know, throughout the book. And, I, I you know, he, he did a good job not being too heavy-handed with that, but, you know, putting enough in there just to kind of remember you had, help you remember how connected the stories were. Um, Although the, it was sort of like a deus ex machina, the odds of them just stumbling upon those three trolls, you know, seemed to be kind of remote. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps, but, yeah. but I don't know. I mean, if they're, if they're like traveling, I don't know, it's not like they were going along the road, but it's like, I don't know, it's like if there were paths and stuff that were already made that were somewhat well-traveled, it's like, it's not, it's not yeah. crazy unlikely that they would stumble upon it, although it's like but the I way mean, that they're like, oh yeah, these paths were made by trolls, but, but it's like, oh, but it's been like 50 or 60 years since they were frozen or turned to stone. Uh, so it's like, well, maybe the path wouldn't be as, yeah. you know, obvious or something. But, but yeah. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I got, I, I got what. What did you guys think of Glorfindel? The elf guy. Of Glorfindel. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I heard you, Glorfindel. Hang on a second. Um, uh, but yeah, like instead of using Arwen like they did in the films. You know, they used um, 
you know, Glorfindel, um, which if you guys did any like <laughs> uh, research on him at all, like he he's definitely a pretty big badass and he's been around a really long time and uh, he killed a Balrog. So, I mean, he's, he's pretty cool. Kind of a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, and then then um, one of the other thoughts I had too, um, I don't know. I guess maybe this goes back to the discussion where they're kind of, uh, you know, where they're asleep at the at the Barrow Downs or whatever. But like, it's like, oh, word's already gone to Elrond, like a couple, you know, almost like a couple weeks ahead of, you know, uh, of them, you know, and it. Is so it's just it's like you know it's like how did how did word get to them so quickly you know I, I mean granted they weren't going along the road you know and I I don't know I was just like I was, I was like oh that's kind of interesting you know that yeah. someone else you know that this random traveling band of elves was able to I like I don't know if they like. Happy, like if their troop traveled all that way or if that guy I think it could be very similar to like how Saruman and Sauron have spies you know they have yeah. birds and different beasts and stuff the elves have all that stuff too so I would yeah. say that a lot of it is traveling from creatures and different things just kind of spreading the word um, back towards Rivendell um, that that that's okay. what they don't I call them Elrond wise or nothing. Do they call him that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Glorfindel. Um, one thing that's interesting about him, so he um, he died in the first. Uh, well, I think he died. Yeah, in the first age. Sorry, How could he have died in the first age if he just showed up in this book? He was reincarnated. So he died fighting a Balrog. The Balrog died. He died too. Um, and then he, um, at this point, they um, they say that he's considered almost as powerful as a Maiar at this point. So he would be not quite on like Gandalf's level, but like pretty close. He also helped de defeat the Witch King in Angmar. Um, so, I mean, yeah, he's, he's like pretty insane. Um, uh, another thing that I thought was really cool and just like gives a lot more weight to like how brave and awesome Frodo is. I love right there at the end, um, whenever they cross the ford and get, and Frodo's by himself on Glorfindel's horse. And, you know, obviously not doing very well, but he turns and draws his sword. Yeah. And oh, basically, yeah, like, like yeah. squares off with these guys. Like, you know, like he's going to do anything, um, but was ready to fight. Yeah. yeah. It, I mean, it, it's just interesting to, I don't know, for them to actually have like voices. Cause I'm, well, cause I mean, it's like up to this point, you had been hearing about them asking questions and stuff, but. It's like, I mean, in the movies, like, I don't, I don't think they ever speak. And uh, in this, they're, you know, it's like he does that and they, they just kind of laugh at him and yeah, you know, just like completely blow off what he's saying, you know, because he's like telling them to go back and <laughs> like, no. And that kind of is like what I was saying about it, them feeling more mortal in this one, you know, is that they even care that he's trying to make the attempt is kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. Um, they, they talk very briefly in the films. Like you hear them whisper Shire Baggins. And then um, whenever they show up at the Ford when they're, when they're chasing Arwen, um, the the witch king says, "Give up the house of the elf," and then she says, "You know, if you want him, come claim him." Come and claim him. You know, very famous. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Saucy minx elf. <laughs> dude, Liv Tyler is really hot. <laughs> no, I was kind of thinking though when you started talking about uh, Luthien. 
yeah it made me think of like casting i was just like okay so you've got galadriel who i think they i don't know if, i don't consider kate blanchett to be like gorgeous or anything but she's pretty and they definitely She's like, I don't know, she, she, she has like an elegance, I guess, that like matches the, the like what they were going for. Right. With the yeah, what they did was perfect. Yeah, but it made me think of, well, you've got Liv Tyler who, you know, ensorcels Aragorn because through her beauty and who she is. And then you've got this Luthien character. I was just like, well, I wonder if in casting, if you had to cast Luthien, who would that be? in this day and age because I, essentially I think they made Galadriel just about as glam of an elf as they could in the books or in the, the movies. Oh, you know, yeah. they, they basically pushed the beautiness of elves as far as they could in the way that they treated her in the films. Oh yeah. So it made me think of who you would put, if you were to cast a Hollywood actress now, who would that be? Yeah, I don't know. L Luthien would be a, a hard, I don't know. I mean, that, that obviously have to be somebody very beautiful, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's it'd be tough. It'd be, yeah, yeah, I and, think and they're, that, they're uh, very different. They're very different characters because Galadriel is kind of like this very, like s tragic beauty very like sad you know and like not very joyful most of the time you know and luthien is the emo. total opposite what'd you say kev the kind of emo yeah she's kind of emo but like luthien is is known for dance luthien i would say the closest thing that we see to her in this book would be the river uh the river uh girl um what's her name uh oh tom bombadil squeeze yeah <laughs> squeeze <laughs> lol um but um you know she would definitely be like a pretty good description of how luthien is described dancing and singing in the woods and and snaring right. you know men with her beauty sort of thing um, it's like golden so Goldie wine or Goldie something or other. Uh, gold, gold, uh, goldberry, goldberry, goldberry. <laughs> it's goldberry. Yeah, it's fatty lumpkins. <laughs> the most majestic. Of horses. Yeah, of the horses. Ke Kevin should just do like a full like expose, like just like a whole like term paper on just like. Fatty Lumpkins. There you go. <laughs> Why, like, Fatty Lumpkins is the real hero of the story. <laughs> the ring would have never made it back. <laughs> if it weren't for Fatty. Yeah, and we totally, like, breezed past that point in the book, which was just, like, hilarious. It's like the minute he saw that there was a ring wraith, he's just, like, <laughs> running to the neighbor's <laughs> house going, I don't have the ring. I don't have it. Somebody <laughs> blow the horn. Blow the horn. <laughs> no, no. You're you're no. talking about Fatty Bulger. We're talking about oh. Fatty Lumpkins the pony. Oh, well, Fatty whatever. <laughs> there are multiple fatties. Yeah, yeah. Well, I thought it was hilarious the way that Fatty ran first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and had them blow the horn that hadn't been blown in a hundred years. He just shows up on somebody's doorstep. Just a big old fat hot mess <laughs> screaming about gosh knows what. And they were like, I don't know what he's talking about, but somebody go grab the horn. It sounds serious. <laughs> and this and this section gives more argument to my whole theory, or gives more credence to my argument that the witch king should not have broken Gandalf's staff. And the extended edition of Return of the King it should have happened because Gandalf the Grey clearly was able to, I mean, he didn't beat him, but he didn't get his ass kicked. Right. Peter Jackson yeah, hated Gandalf. Staff. No big deal. You know, it's a very big good. deal, Kevin. It's a very big deal. Man, I, I bet I could break Gandalf's staff. I bet Gandalf could break you. 
don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anywho. Yeah. All right. Favorite characters or whatever. Yep. Mm. Who is everybody's favorite character this week? I think that I'd have to go back to Fatty. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I just could picture that in my head of him waddling out the back door. And <laughs> <laughs> All right. I can get with that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I really did like the innkeeper. He, he was, he was, he was an Butterball. <laughs> Butterbird. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and and the thing is, is like I'm like the the story. It kind of, you know, it for the most part, it just kind of does beat by beat. But I thought I thought it was like interesting how, you know, I the I don't know whoever's telling the story, Frodo or whatever, like takes this time to like talk about like oh well, you know, it looked like you know. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, whenever he like went and paid for the pony and he was so sorry about the other ones, how he was like losing out on money. But it's like, they made a point to like talk about how, oh no, no, it's fine. The horse, the, you know, only one got stolen. The rest went back to, to fatty lumpkins. And when Tom heard yeah. about it, you know, and so I like, I, I don't know. I, I was just like, it's like a kind of a weird aside, you know, like just kind of like a little like go over here for a minute and, come back you know it doesn't really you know it's like it didn't really do anything to like move the story along but i just i, I thought it was interesting that that they took the time or uh, tolkien took the time to explain that that he he actually wasn't put out by that by his act of kindness it made me kind of wonder why he it's kind of like what you said it, it reminded me uh kind of you were talking about it, of like solo it's like he was answering all these questions that didn't really necessarily need answered, but for some yeah. reason or other, when he was writing the books, it was like, oh, don't feel bad for good old Butterbur. You know, he wasn't <laughs> yeah, out those 12 yeah. silver pennies. He was able to <laughs> recoup his losses by just keeping the horses that weren't his to begin with. He's fine. <laughs> All is well. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a mix for me. It'd be hard to pick, but so Aragorn I definitely definitely love Strider yeah. in this portion of the book. He's pretty awesome. Um and just his like sucking. command over the group. What'd you say? I said does he does he suck in later portions of of, of, the, of the book? Is it I feel like there are times where like Aragorn it? is not as featured. And like it, it splits wow. more into focusing on the trio of him, Gimli and Legolas more. And so you don't get as much like personal, like just focus time on Aragorn. And so I like this portion of the book where it just kind of gives you a little bit more insight into his personality. Cause a lot of yeah. like what happens from here is just going to be their motive, like whatever they're aimed at, whether it's rescuing Mary and Pip or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, but I also like I also even though Gandalf isn't like actually like he has no dialogue well, in any of this. Gandalf, he wasn't in this part. Yeah, but listen, he was in it. And I, I one of the things that I love about Gandalf as as the book goes on is like this like you kind of have like good and evil and you have different forces pulling strings on either side. And I love that Gandalf is always doing something to pull strings for good all the time. There's always something, whether even when he's not in the forefront, you'll see this a lot more in Two Towers. Gandalf is always riding off, doing something to set things up for the party to be successful. Yeah. And I, I, I've always appreciated that about his character. You just always need the daddy. <laughs> Daddy always has to be your favorite character. <laughs> I, I I'll get Gandalf is probably overall, you know, overall him and him and Bombadil are, you know, two of my favorite characters, period. You know, and in Lord of the Rings. That I mean Gimli is is probably the one that I connect the most with, 
just because I just think he's really funny and I, I enjoy him as a character. But Gandalf is, is I don't know, he he's such a cool and complex character throughout the books and they do a great job with him. Um, so, Well, we will leave it until next week. All well, right. Well, we start with uh, mini meeting or, or with uh, what is it? Mini meetings. Yep. 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 Cool. Well, hopefully, we'll all be here next week. Sounds good yep. to me. Yep. All right. Bye, kid. Later.